see and hear me, I suppose? Yes, I can. Okay, good, good, yeah. Welcome to the webinar session of Department of Development, Communication, Extension and Journalism Institute of Home Economics, University of Delhi. This is a webinar series and our today's topic is Social Movements and New Media Lessons from Bhopal. Social movements primarily take the form of non-institutionalized collective political action, which strive for political or we can say social change. While India has witnessed many such movements over the centuries, the concept of social movements gained currency in new media very, very recently. So today we have with us Dr. Pavas Bish, lecturer in media, culture and creative practice at the School of Humanities, Kiel University, UK. In his works as a researcher and documentary filmmaker, he examines the intersections of media, memory and politics at both individual and collective levels. His ethnographic research and social movements and memory work in relation to the Bhopal gas disaster has been published in leading journals. Today, he has taken out time for the webinar to share his knowledge on the topic. I welcome you, Powers, and thank you very much for this time. And over to you now. Thank you, Yuki. Um, I'm very happy to be joining you from Nottingham, my home. Um, and, uh, you know, thank you really to Yuki for this opportunity. Uh, I was meant to be in India um, towards the end of March and in April. Uh, uh, you know, New Delhi is my home city. Uh, Yuki and I studied together at the Mass Communication Research Center. And it was a great disappointment to me to not be able to travel because of the lockdown. So when Yuki contacted me uh, to uh, about this opportunity of speaking to you, I was really delighted and I'm so happy to be um, sharing some of my research with you. Um, this is such an important uh, subject. Uh, Yuki has already uh, been stressed some of uh, the significance of, of this issue uh, in her introduction. And I also really liked uh, the whoever wrote that introduction on, on the Facebook page, uh, post was also uh, absolutely on the mark. You know, this relationship between social movements and news media is so, so significant. It's significant uh, for social movements in terms of their external publics, because really um, to achieve their aims uh, to effect uh, the political and social changes that they're seeking to effect, they need to reach out to the wider publics and they need to be able to put pressure on the political actors and, and on, on the actors that hold actual political power. And secondly, in relation to the internal audience, um, recognition in mainstream news media is extremely significant in terms of, um, you know, gaining a sense of recognition. The supporters of the social movement begin to feel that, yes, the movement wields power, that there is a certain legitimacy um, in terms of the issues that they are uh, campaigning for. So absolutely this relationship between social movements and news media and, and the ability of social movements to gain representation within news media is absolutely vital. This is also a very important time to be speaking about this issue because I think, um, and, and we, can, we can talk about this in the question and answer session afterwards, I think we are in a difficult moment politically. Uh, we're seeing this across the world. Um, I think uh, democratic processes are, are being um, really challenged and questioned. We have uh, majoritarian, totalitarian governments uh, or governments leaning towards those tendencies in, in many countries across the world, in Europe, in Latin America, in the US, of course, most famously, also in India. Um, so social movements um, are key political actors that are really trying to challenge some of these tendencies that we're seeing within our political systems and our media systems and they're really i think key actors um, for maintaining the health of our democratic system so i think this is a really important moment also to be talking about this issue now um Popal is something uh, that i have been working on for a really long time i first became uh, aware of the movement in Bhopal when I was an undergraduate student um, like you. I studied um, a, a BA degree in English literature at Hindu College, and uh, it was from uh, one of my uh, lecturers there 
that I had this first introduction with the movement in Bhopal. So that was, um, you know, uh, way back in 2001. So it really has been uh, an engagement of almost two decades. Um, I started my PhD work on Bhopal in 2009, um, and I did that at uh, Loughborough University in the UK. So I moved away to the UK to start this PhD, and I completed that PhD in 2013. Um, the presentation that I'm sharing with you actually draws on a lot of the research work that I did then for the PhD, but it is also drawing on uh, my subsequent engagement um, you know, with the movement. So it's really a long-term engagement with this uh, specific social movement. Okay, so um, let's get started. Uh, hopefully this will work. Right. So, you know, I've already established the need for social movements to seek representation in um, news media, especially mainstream news media. But actually, it is really, really difficult for social movements, especially movements that we might label as radical social movements, to access media, to secure the space within mainstream news media. Now, radical is often used as a label to delegitimize social movements. You know, you often hear this label being used often by mainstream news media as a negative label to, um, to suggest that there is something extreme about certain social movements. I am using this label actually as a positive label, as a critical label to identify movements that are really seeking to challenge dominant and established ideologies. These can be ideologies that are linked to uh, established economic ideas like neoliberal development. So all movements that are linked to um, anti-capitalism, environmentalism, a lot of these movements are challenging established ideas of you know, what constitutes uh, development. So if you look at the picture on uh, the left-hand side of your screen, this is from the protest in 2012-13 um, against uh, a nuclear plant this is from the state of uh, Tamil Nadu, uh, Kudankulam. And um, so this is an anti-nuclear protest, um, a long running movement uh, from people who were worried about, um, you know, not being included in the discussions around um, uh, the safety of their coastal communities, uh, you know, worried about um, effects on their livelihoods, um, you know, from this large nuclear facility that was really cited on their doorstep. And this movement, again, um, you know, really struggled to get um, any news representation. Um, a more recent example is, um, is one on the right hand side of your screen. You see this is a forest rights rally. This is actually um, from uh, one of their actions at Jantar Mantar. And you see, um, you know, this is again a coalition of um, different social movements many representing um, you know, Adivasis, um, indigenous people from different states in India that are demanding the proper implementation of the Forest Rights Act to protect uh, their access to traditional lands upon which their ways of life and livelihoods depend. Um, and again, a movement like this you know, struggles to get representation within uh, the mainstream news media. Um, they struggle because they are representing people who are disempowered. Uh, these are movements who traditionally do not have the kind of, uh, you know, media access and the aims um, and ideas and stories that they're trying to tell do not fit in with the established narratives and frames in mainstream me media. These are often labeled as anti-development um, social movements. Okay, even if, um, a social movement uh, enters news representation, very often the frames that get um, attached to it are completely negative. So here is an example on your screens now um, of the very recent protests, ongoing protests in the US at the moment. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of it. Uh, George Floyd, a black American man, uh, was killed by um, a white policeman. Um, another example of um, you know systemic uh, racism um, in the US, um, movements like Black Lives Matter, other, other civil rights movements are now on the streets protesting against this very recent killing. And here is Fox News 
um, you know, completely uh, removing attention from those systemic issues, uh, very real systemic issues around around structural racism, and instead labeling uh, you know these protesters as a mob and focusing only on the aspect of rioting. So you see this this kind of very negative framing that protest often acquires um, and movements often acquire. An example from closer home. This is uh, you know. A coverage from 2018. Some of you might remember this. We had, uh, you know, a violent attack on Dalit um, community, which was celebrating, uh, marking a key event in Bhima Koregao. And um, after that violent attack, there were protests in several cities. And here is the Times of India again. You know, look at the label uh, of mobs. Uh, we see that label. Um, being used again to focus uh, on protests and movements as something entirely negative as something entirely disruptive so this is you know this is just to illustrate the challenge that social movements are, are, are facing that one they don't get media representation second when they do get media representation when they enter the news cycle they are often um, being attached with only this kind of disruptive framing and negative framing so in this context, what can we learn from um, Bhopal? Um, you know, Bhopal is a is certainly an example of a movement that has um, grappled creatively with some of these challenges over a long period of time. I'm quite aware that most of the students on this call, uh, you know, were born after the year 2000. So. Um, for, for you, the Bhopal gas disaster really is something, uh, you know, in deep history. Um, I will give you some context for this and I will explain to you, um, you know, how, what has happened over the 35 years of this, of this movement. Um, but I'm sure many of you encountered uh, at least uh, some mention of this disaster in the very recent coverage of, uh, you know, this very um, unfortunate um, gas leak in Vizak, which is um which was really like a, a reenacting of the of the of the Bhopal tragedy. So these are some pictures from from that recent coverage. I will I will again talk about this connection a little little bit later in my in my presentation. So just to remind you and set the scene for you know what happened in Bhopal, what was the context for the social movement there, um, some some background information. Um, the gas leak in Bhopal um, happened from a pesticide factory um, in the city of Bhopal. The factory was run by um, Union Carbide Limited. Um, this was a an Indian subsidiary of a large American chemicals um, corporation. Uh, the leak happened on the night of 2nd uh, December, early morning of 3rd December. And it was a horrific disaster. Um, Eight to twelve thousand people uh, died in their sleep. Uh, you know, on that on that same night. Subsequently, figures vary um, between twenty-five died from uh, injuries that were sustained in that initial leak. Um, several hundred thousand more continue to suffer from chronic illnesses that are linked to this gas exposure. It was. An incredible event. Um, you know, I have this picture from the Time magazine, um, you know, which is giving you a sense of how significant this was um, globally. An American company was involved, the scale of the suffering and the death. So it was really, um, you know, um, media coverage was uh, across global um, news outlets. This was really, really significant. However, what subsequently happened is um, a complete forgetting. The Indian government wanted to uh, quickly move on uh, at that time. And subsequently, um, you know, the Indian government, like many other governments across the world, has been following a policy of, um, you know, neoliberal capitalism, uh, dependent upon flows of international money, um, corporate money. So a narrative about um, uh, a transnational corporation you know, not doing the right thing was not a narrative that they wanted to remember. So the, it was very logical that they tried to um, suppress it. Also, the fact that they were not able to protect their own public um, and ensure their safety was not a narrative that they wanted to remember. The corporation, of course, did not want to uh, remember because it wanted to carry on with its work of making profit. Um, 
So a financial settlement was reached between these two main actors in 1989, and their attempt was to um, completely uh, settle the disaster and say, okay, it's been fixed, everything's been fixed, all the injuries have been fixed, let's move on. What was not acknowledged in all of this was the fact that um, you know, people continued to suffer, uh, that there wasn't ever a real understanding of you know, the long-term nature of the injuries that people had sustained. What was also not recognized in this settlement and subsequently by both the state and the companies involved was that there was a second disaster that began to happen, had already been happening since the factory um, had been set up, which was the a disaster linked to the contamination of the um, underground water around the factory site. This contamination had already started when the factory was in operation. It continued after the gas leak because the factory was abandoned, wasn't cleaned up properly. So now we have a site um, of uh, you know, several kilometers radius around the factory site where several hundred thousand poor, very poor people live, um, where the groundwater is entirely contaminated, where the soil is contaminated, and people, um, you know, for want of um, any other clean supply of water, have been drinking this groundwater. And so you, you have now a whole new population of victims. Um, many of these are children who are now being born with various deformities. Um, so it's a completely new set of injuries and new victims. So you, you, you see, Bhopal is an ongoing environmental disaster. Um, you know, the injuries from the first leak continue, but we also have these new set of injuries. So the social movement in Bhopal is campaigning for justice for these injuries, the old continuing injuries and these new um, injuries from the water contamination. What's been happening in terms of the news reporting? The news reporting, unfortunately, um, you know, has not been able to keep up. Um, the news coverage has been very episodic. Um, largely, the news coverage is limited to uh, the anniversary of the disaster um, or, you know, when um, some new report comes out or something like that. It is very often lacking context. They are not able to trace the history of the disaster. They're not able to trace the connections to corporate actors, to corporations. So it's, it's very, very limited. Um, and it is in this context that the social movement had to really intervene um, to make visible all of these missing connections, um, to restore to Bhopal uh, that global significance. Um, let me just show you um, at this point some examples of, um, of some of this episodic um, coverage, just to give you some some sense of this. Um, so if this will allow me to do that. Second. Right. So just to give you a, a sense of, you know, um, the, the, the kind of coverage that we, we get. So this is just from Google News. I, I was just looking at what was the anniversary coverage around this anniversary. And you can see, uh, you know, this is the top story from NDTV. It's a commemorative story. Just very quickly looking at what is the nature of, uh, you know, what, what, what's the framing? What is the story that they're trying to tell? And if you, if you see, um, it says, lest we forget Bhopal gas tragedy that choked thousands to death in 1984. Uh, from that headline, again, it's apparent that the focus is entirely on that gas leak, on the event of the gas leak back then, 35 years ago. The, from the very headline, you can tell that they are not uh, emphasizing the continuing nature of the injury and the, the current disaster of the water contamination. I mean, if you go on to read more of this, you will see that it's largely focused on the past. There is uh, some mention of current um, injuries, but there is no uh, real mentioning, uh, well, no mentioning at all of the issue of water contamination. Um, and then it ends very simply by looking at some social media, um, you know, tweets that went out on the anniversary. So an example, perfect example of this kind of episodic coverage it's the anniversary. Let's do a story. The story is entirely focused on the past. They pick some Twitter tweets, and that's it. Um, and and this is NDTV.com. You know, one of our 
supposedly um, you know quality um, uh, news outlets. Um, so so you're seeing the problem um, you know that that I'm trying to illustrate. Having said that, um, not everything is. Um, it doesn't mean that other frames don't exist. And just as an example of, um, uh, you know, another news outlet, NewsClick, which is one of the new, um, newer uh, digital um, startups, um, news uh, platforms, chooses to lead with the contaminated groundwater framing um, and chooses to give voice to the victims. Actually, this is a, a story that really takes on that frame of uh, the continuing disaster. If you read more of this, um, you can see that they're illustrating here the um, infected, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the communities that are affected by the water contamination. And you also have quotes later on in here from um, groups such as the Bhopal Group for Information and Action that are a key part of the uh, campaign for justice in Bhopal. So we are seeing, uh, you know, these are two stories that are illustrating for you. One, the problem of the episodic reactive coverage that is the dominant uh, trend. But I'm also showing you how through the work of the social movements, this other frame is, is present. Um, one very final um, uh, example, just to show the current uh, news frames. This is the story from the Hindustan Times about the Vaisak gas leak, and you can see them making the connection to the Bhopal gas tragedy, so that's important. What is heartening about this story is that towards the end of the story, the last paragraph actually mentions the ongoing water contamination in, um, in Bhopal. So again, an example of how the movement has been successful to um, ensure that this narrative of the second disaster um, you know, is is being picked up in the is being picked up um, in in news media. So let me just return to the PowerPoint. So um, that was just a quick example of uh, you know what was just some of the current coverage. To give you a little bit more context on, uh, you know, what is the social movement so uh, that I'm talking about? So this is a group called the International Campaign for Justice in Bhopal. It's a coalition of survivors organizations based in Bhopal. So these are made up of, you know, um, the survivors from the gas leak, but also some people who are now from the water um, affected communities. But they are they are supported by long term middle class activists, um, uh, educated, media savvy who have been supporting the movement for a really long time. And they also have international allies based in countries such as um, the UK and the US. The movement's aim is to really, uh, you know, shift the focus away from this kind of, um, uh, just the focus on the past, to emphasize the current global environmental disaster. Their aim is to really shift attention to this idea of the second disaster, the water contamination, new injuries. This is significant for them because it, it restores focus on the responsibility, the continuing responsibility of the government, but also of the American corporations, um, Union Carbide and Union Carbide's new owner, Dow Chemicals. Now, how are they able to do this? What strategies are they employing uh, to make sure that outlets such as the Hindustan Times do mention this narrative of the water contamination? They're able to do this and their ability to do this is dependent to a large degree on new resources, opportunities and networks that emerged um, around the um, you know, turn of the millennium towards the late 1990s, early 2000s, when digital communications technologies, um, ICT became affordable um, um, and, and arrived in India in an accessible way. Um, it is at that point that they established the Bhopal.net website, which is the key um, you know, platform for uh, some of the media strategies. I'll show you the website and we'll look at it, what they're doing with it in, in, in some detail. But before we go there, I want to just lay out a, um, a, a theoretical, a conceptual um, uh, bit of framework for you. Um, because you're students of journalism, um, you know, I, 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 I think it's important for me to bring in some, uh, some theoretical frameworks that you might find uh, useful in understanding, um, you know, how uh, 
media systems are operating. So this is the work of a um, scholar called Andrew Chadwick. Um, you might be aware of his work. So um, in a very um, important uh, text uh, in, in 2013, uh, he writes about the hybrid media system. Now, what Chadwick basically is arguing um, is that we should be a little bit wary about this idea that somehow digital technology is a is a straightforward way for um, you know traditionally disempowered actors like social movements um, or for the general public to bypass the mainstream media and somehow exercise power. He says that that's too simple. You know, it's too simple. This this idea that digital somehow allows you to go around mainstream media, and now you've got this new technology, and you can do everything. Everything's fine. He instead argues that we need to think about this in a more complex way. Um, current media systems are not, uh, you know, a simple replacement of the old traditional uh, news media with with new media. Um, even though new media would like to tell you that story about, about itself. Um, but actually what we see is that they um, exist alongside each other and there are very interesting interconnections between uh, newer um, uh, media platforms and the older existing um, traditional platforms. And actually the actors who are really powerful who are the ones who are able to move between these new and old systems. Um, so this is what is very interesting about his, his, his approach and his idea that actually what is interesting, actually what is powerful in this current system is hybrid mobilizations. So a key idea that he advances is that the internet is allowing activists and social movements to catch up with the 24 hour news cycle and respond with speed to emerging news agendas. So what he's basically saying is that digital technologies are being used not to bypass um, you know, uh, traditional media, but to actually ensure that you're getting represented, that you can guide the, the, the frames and, um, you know, how stories are being told um, in um, uh, the traditional media, in, 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 in the mainstream media. So, uh, so keep this in mind, you know, and I will show you um, examples of how this is happening in relation to Bhopal. So let's just now have a look at uh, the website, and I can show you some examples of how this happens. Stop sharing. I'm sorry that this um, switching is a bit um, cumbersome. Um, yeah. So uh, this is the website of for the um, for the campaign, um, and um, you know I would really encourage you to explore the website um, and on, on your own um, to, to, to follow up on the analysis that I'm very quick analysis that I'm doing now. But you will discover that the website is completely oriented to the media logics um, you know, of the mainstream um, of mainstream journalism. Um, so it's completely oriented uh, to the needs of um, journalists. Um, and it's completely driven by uh, a desire to ensure that, uh, you know, its narratives get picked up and, and moved into the domain of mainstream media. So if you look at the, the, the first way in which it does this is if you look at the key sections, um, uh, aside from this um, section on the curative petition, which is something to do with the legal case that's um, still going on in relation to Bhopal, the other three key tabs are all media related. So we have a for the media tab, we have a recent news tab, which again contains press releases, statements, um, newsletters. Uh, we have something for Hindi um, uh, journalists. So um, you again have um, here press releases. The whole format in which they are presenting um, uh, the news is, is actually um, entirely in the form of press releases. So this is the landing page. Now, let's look at this first um, post on this landing page. Um, Shocking news of the gassing of thousands in Vizag rends our hearts, but it fails to surprise us. Um, this is a, a press release. And again, you know, you, the, you know the, remember the point I was making about and that Chadwick was highlighting, that this is about being very agile and responding to events that are happening and to make connections with them so that you can enter 
uh, news representation. So you can see, as soon as something like that happened there, the movement in Bhopal responds immediately, drafts a press release, makes that connection uh, between what happened in Bhopal, what happened in Bizak. If you read the press note, it will really say, you know, that lessons were not learned, learned from Bhopal. You can see the headline is already indicating that. And it's, again, telling the story of how, you know, what needs to be done, this kind of um, uh, the, the, the ensuring that corporations are responsible and that the state takes care of the of the um, of its people. You can see that there are press releases linked to COVID. Um, so again, extremely important. Uh, when Trump visited just before we entered lockdown in India, um, uh, you can see that they put out a press release um, uh, protesting against uh, Trump's visit because, of course, the companies involved in the Bhopal disaster are American. You can see that everything, uh, you know, all the press statements are framed as complete uh, news reports. So uh, you can, if you're a journalist, choose to just copy and paste this into your um, into your website, into your publication, and they're deliberately designed, uh, you know, in this way to ensure that there is that kind of reproduction. We know uh, news cycles demand speed. Um, news organizations are working with very limited um, staff, especially some of the online news organizations. So this is designed to respond to that need. And I've seen in my own research. Uh, you know, many instances where straight uh, verbatim reproduction of press releases is, is, is happening. So this is working as a strategy. So, so what we're seeing is really, uh, you know, a website that is catering to the needs of, um, you know, of, of uh, journalists and journalist practices. Um, another um, uh, very important um, section that I would like to show you as part of this website is in the For the Media tab, they have um, an information section. And this is really um, remarkable because what, it, uh, what they have here in a very accessible format is the entire information that you would need, the key information that you would need to write a story that is thematic, you know, that allows you to provide a history to what you're reporting on, that allows you to make connections between the past, the present, and the future. So, you know, so they are attempting uh, to ensure that journalists have information at hand, which allows them to write a thematic story that allows them to write a story that has that historic context, that has the kind of understanding of thematic issues. So you can see, you know, what are our, our, our demands? What is the history of, uh, you know, this movement? What is the timeline? You know, they're giving you all of that information. So it's really showing you how they are through a digital platform like their own website, attempting to ensure and guide um, mainstream uh, news representation in a particular direction, which is more in, in line with their um, own aims. Um, so just returning to, hopefully that's given you some sense of you know, how, how this is working. Um, so just returning to the PowerPoint presentation again. Right. Um, so just summarizing. So, you know, so they they are using the website to explicitly address the requirements of the local and national media. They are making press releases available in Hindi and English. These are complete news stories allowing for speed, verbatim reproduction. Now that we just saw, you know, you had the Wysak story, you had the story, um, stories around COVID, you had the Trump story, the timing, content and framing of the press releases and press conferences is carefully aligned to the shifting agendas of local and national news. And what it's also doing is it very effectively exploits the very predictable pattern of anniversary journalism. So they know that around each anniversary, there is going to be some coverage. So they make sure that around that anniversary, they are having multiple events, multiple press conferences, releasing key reports that ensures that the um, issue of the continuing contamination, the continuing liability of the corporations remains in the news coverage. OK, so we're moving towards the final part of the presentation. I want to say a little bit about you know, how, how the movement has also been successful in, in accessing other national media systems and other global news platforms um, like the BBC, um, for instance, 
and how this in turn has been very effective in getting national media to uh, take on some of the uh, frames that they would like uh, to be adopted. So um, I, I'm focusing on the 2012 London Olympics. Again, um, you know, this is also a, a, an event that is in, in the distant past for many of you. Some of you might, might remember some of it. But let me just give you a, a quick um, uh, breakdown of what happened. Dow Chemicals uh, was a key sponsor for the Olympics in London, the 2012 Olympics in London. It was one of the sustainability partners uh, of uh, the London Olympic. It is completely ironic, we might laugh about it, that a company that is uh, has a history of environmental contamination is chosen as the sustainability partner of a large global event. But we know that um, you know greenwashing um, uh, corporations are very effective um, you know, in using uh, some of the CSR initiatives. Um, they are, have big budgets in PR um, uh, to, to precisely do that, to precisely make sure that the public narrative around the corporation at least appears to be green. So this was part of that attempt. When the people in Bhopal realized that Dow was a you know, who is um, uh, a key, uh, who the company owning Union Carbide is a key sponsor for this large global event, they immediately started a campaign to get Dow removed as the sponsor. And they also put pressure on the Indian government to say that they will not send a team to the Olympics, to the 2012 Olympics. Now, their efforts at uh, forcing the government to, um, you know, issue some kind of statement or to stop the team from going were not proving to be very effective. At this stage, they were very effective in getting their UK allies to access the UK news media. So what happened is some of their local supporters in the UK managed to get local politicians, um, you know, so some people who were part of the London Assembly, and I have this picture here, um, you know, so the picture on the bottom right hand corner of your screen is a picture from one of the most famous, um, you know, news programs. It's called Newsnight. It goes out on BBC. It's a key um, news show. And the woman you see in your picture is Meredith Alexander. She was part of a commission that looked after the sustainability aspects of the London Olympics. So the movement in Hopal was able to gain the support of a key spokesperson like her. And she went on air on this program and resigned publicly on this news program. So this was a live resignation. And it completely captured the news cycle um, in the UK. Um, when this happened, uh, you know, this capturing of, uh, of, of the new uh, news cycle in, in the UK media, but in kind of um, uh, platforms that have significant transnational impact like the BBC, Indian um, media had to take notice. So let me just give you an example of what happened then in the, um, in the Indian coverage. So hopefully you are now um, seeing the Seeing this video, you can you confirm that uh, now the that uh, you, yes yes, yes okay that. right that's fine so let me just play you this very short clip from NDTV so you can see that uh, what happened then. Is, uh, is the audio, audio is, uh, the audio is not uh, the audio yeah. is not audible. I, I'm I'm sorry about that. So I, I think what basically uh, because technology hampers us, but what is very interesting again, you know, you can you can I'll, I'll I'll make the link available and all the links available through Yuki after this presentation. But what is very interesting is following that kind of coverage there, Indian media started questioning Indian uh, politicians and saying. Okay, if British MPs and British political actors are questioning Dow's participation in the in the Olympics, why aren't you taking a stand in this? So you get this very interesting intersection between uh, you know um, a national media systems, and you see how globalization uh, you know allows for these kind of productive intersections. Um, so. Actually, then the Indian uh, media took on this kind of nationalistic framing of, okay, the Indian politicians need to do something. And um, 
following this pressure from uh, the Indian media, there was, um, uh, you know, more statements, there was, uh, you know, more political pressure that was um, uh, um, put forward by Indian political actors. But you can see the kind of strange circuit that had to be uh, followed for that to for that to happen. So that's an example of you know how this how the movement has been very effective in 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 in, um, in doing this. Okay, so summing up, while this presentation has been looking at you know the very creative hybrid mobilizations that a movement like Bhopal has been undertaking to ensure that its ideas, its stories, its frames, um, the themes um, that it wants to be covered um, in relation to the disaster get coverage in mainstream move, um, media. We see that this kind of thematic coverage is very difficult to sustain. So I've seen this in my research that these kind of there are these moments of opportunity like the 2012 London Olympics, um, and we see these these thematic ideas um, emerge, but they very quickly from mainstream media they disappear very quickly. The coverage tends to return to largely episodic uh, nature. It largely tends to focus on national actors. So, you know, in the beginning, I showed you that NDTV story. So it returns to that kind of very conventional news frame. Some uh, Sometimes, you know, we see party political frames. So it will say, okay, you know, what did the BJP do or what did the Congress do and who is responsible? Um, so we see that kind of party political framing returns. Also, not this kind of hybrid media work requires a lot of resources, a lot of training. It requires long-term planning. It requires support from media allies, and it is not possible for many movements. And finally, this kind of need for media literacy, for media capacities, means that um, you know, if there are some people within the movement who have this kind of capacity, those people acquire greater power. So this can also create hierarchies within movements and can cause divisions within movements. So again, you can see that, you know, while I've told you a story which is which is promising and highlights some of the potentials, we have to be also very, very aware of the challenges um, and the difficulties that that still confront um, social movements as they as they try to negotiate this relationship. OK, um, that's all that I had to say. Hopefully you have some questions and I'd be very happy to answer these. Um, there are references embedded here. I have mentioned to Yuki already that I'll make available the presentation as a PDF um, so you can click on different links. All, uh, all of my publications are available um, you know, off my profile. So you can, if you are interested, you can, you can explore these. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pavis. Uh, it was really interesting to know how social movements and new media um, go hand in hand and how systematically you have explained uh, the, the movements being covered by television, what kind of, how they reword the things as which is happening very recently that um, in, in US that it is a mob violence. So thank you very much for such even current informations linking it with Bhopal gas tragedy. Uh, now I request all the participants, if you have any questions, you can ask them via chat window or if you want to come on the screen and uh, open up your mic and want to talk to Pavas, feel free to do that. So anyone, any questions? Ma'am, I have a question. Yeah, please tell your name and go ahead with the question. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, I'm Subhashni. Uh, and I wanted to ask that the Indian media is largely dominated by the political environment. So they do not cover stories like this. So uh, what is the way forward if any journalist wants to cover stories like this? Uh, how he should get motivated for this? Yeah, I think that's a very good question, Subhashini. Um, thank you for that. Um, you know, you're absolutely right. I uh, I think you're absolutely on the mark to say that our media systems are dominated by, um, you know, political news, but political in the very narrow sense of, of focusing on parties. Um, and um, and unfortunately, uh, you know, this is true of many other um, media systems as well um, globally. Um, so it is difficult to disrupt this cycle. Um, but having said that, you know, the examples that I showed you um, are, are exactly uh, instances where social movements are trying to um, 
break the cycle um, and to insert their kind of thematic concerns into it. Also, um, you know, there are, while I didn't uh, mention this as part of my presentation, there are journalists who are able to build long term relationships with social movements. You know, so there are many journalists who have, over the course of 25 years, consistently covered the Bhopal movement. There will always be newsworthy moments. Uh, you know, so now this gas leak happened in Visa. If you're a journalist who wants to talk about environmental uh, safety, um, this is the perfect opportunity for you to get a big thematic piece out because at the moment, you're, any editor will accept it because there is, that's part of the current cycle. You know? so, but to be able to do that in a way that is um, you know, uh, able to bring in the kind of appropriate context that is um, you know, historically sensitive, uh, is meeting some of the kind of needs of the social movement, you need some understanding. Um, you need information, you need, um, you know, uh, all of that. So it's the movement is trying to make this easier by creating resources like the ones I showed you on the website. But also what is important is that they, they are trying to create relationships with journalists. So if you as a young journalist, uh, you know, want to do this kind of work, I would say get in touch with social movements, um, you know, get to know their work, build those relationships. You're absolutely right. Maybe the majority of your work will still be the, you know, party political stuff. But there will be opportunities like this where you will be able to, um, you know, tell these stories uh, or you'll be able to find creative ways of telling these stories. So, yeah, that's, you know, um, an imperfect answer. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for answering it. And one more thing that uh, basically channels focus on TRP. So stories yeah. like these do not get the TRP. So how to, uh, you know, deal with that? Yeah, I mean, the thing is that, you know, it's not... Uh, you, you are right that there are these kind of uh, assumptions about you know what the public what the public wants. Um, but I think um, to be honest, uh, this is I think this is a false idea that uh, that the that the public does not want to hear about um, you know stories like the ones in Bhopal or about movements um, you know um, happening. If you think about it, these are people's movements. You know, these are uh, issues that are affecting real people. Uh, so the forest rights movements, you know, the uh, Dalit movement. These are, you know, these are not small populations. These are populations, huge populations. Of course, they want to read uh, about it. The problem sometimes is that journalism is dominated by, um, you know, maybe people like us, uh, middle class, uh, you know, very, we, we are sometimes very far away. We have our own assumptions about what the people want. So sometimes the, the, this idea that, you know, this is not, I think it's a false idea. And as a journalist, you should try and question it when people say, okay, this will not be relevant. And you, you should say, okay, why should, why would this not be relevant, you know? Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, hi, ma'am. Priksha here. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, Priksha, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, go ahead, Priksha. Okay. okay. Uh, hi, sir. This is Priksha here. I'm a final year student of journalism at IIT. Uh, I firstly just want to thank you for your time and for the wonderful talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you something on the lines of what Subhashini asked and your talk. It's like uh, we realize that um, media coverage is not uh, right at the moment. Uh, pull it it's politicized and uh, there are a lot of things happening out there that need more coverage other than politics. But we as audience realize it. And as you mentioned that this narrative that the audience does not want to read this is not right. So wh why do you think that the media is not realizing it? But well, I don't think they don't realize it. But why are they shying away from covering stories that matter there is one fact that um, they have investments from these big corporations mm. but do you think that is the only reason that is uh, making them shy away from doing so i think you know um, it's a complex set of reasons you're absolutely um right about there being corporate interests uh, we absolutely that that idea that you know a lot of our um, mainstream television media is owned um by um, you know, very narrow set of corporate interests. Uh, that is absolutely true. And that does mean that editorial decisions are made about uh, not covering stories that would, uh, you know, directly challenge, um, you know, the interests of these, of these people. So that's a big, big reason. And, you know, I think more broadly, what we need is 
sometimes a, a uh, you know a way of uh, of of because sometimes these these stories are also seen as kind of threatening that you know they say okay this story is too unfamiliar who uh, who are these people we don't know these people you know they're adivasis they're indigenous um, you know how do they so there is a kind of um, storytelling gap as well um, so um, so I think uh you you're absolutely right it's a combination of uh you know ownership interest it's a it's it's the fact that um a lot of journalists are part of a of an elite urban middle class that actually uh believes and shares in the values of uh neoliberal uh you know, capitalism um so they actually might think that a lot of these movements are simply anti-development so they feel that actually these ideas should not be supported but also they have they often don't understand the stories they often don't really know who these people are what is the story they don't understand the story so if they don't understand what the story is whose story it is why it's important they would not be able to uh, you know even imagine uh, what is possible so uh, this is a limitation of course the speed of news production is also another problem to understand uh, a complex story you need a little bit of time to create those relationships to have that historical understanding contemporary journalism is not affording journalists that kind of um, time they're not encouraged to to do that so so you know that too is all contributing to it but but that doesn't you know you as a young journalist i would say this still does not mean that you can't do this kind of journalism. You can do this kind of journalism, but it does mean that you will have to make an, a real effort to create those relationships um, with the social movements to get that kind of understanding, to capture those stories. And then I'm sure you can tell stories that will be powerful. We see actually that the kind of, you know, in India and internationally, there are news platforms that do carry those thematic stories, but the percentage is very small but but you know you can be a part of uh, making that bigger i Thank understand you, the concerns you. of uh, students who are soon to be a journalist that if they want to do such good work that's on <laughs> how and where they'll get the platform but i must say here that uh, new media is one field yes. which allows you to, co to convey whatever you want to and this is a new platform for social movements and you all have been big activists during so many things happening in Delhi recently. Uh, so I'm sure... Uh, uh, Ma'am, can, can, I, can I just make a comment or maybe an observation? If you sure, like. sure, Imran. Imran is also a faculty member in the department. Thank you, Pawas, uh, for this lucid and wonderful presentation. Uh, actually, uh, my uh, question is a little bit, not a question, but maybe an observation that mm -hmm. we can mm -hmm. add to later. Absolutely. Is, is it the time... Uh, the, the, you know, talking specifically in the context of research, is it the time that we move beyond uh, framing research? Because, you know, the, the, the preposition uh, of this question is that, see, uh, when, you, uh, when you do a frame analysis of, of a particular story, for instance, all right? So what we tend to understand of fr by framing research is that how a story, how a particular story has been framed. So the framing, yes. uh, framing essentially is a very... You know, it's a, it's a very voluntary kind of a very conscious way of doing something, you know, to frame means to consciously frame something, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, as you responded to Preksha's uh, query on, you know, when you, when you actually demarcated, you know, various yeah. complex processes involving journalism, yeah. you know, the profession yeah. of journalism. Yeah. So yeah. I would like to really uh, understand how does uh, the, 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 you know, the, the you know, conceptual frameworks within the frame research, within the larger frame research, make us actually understand all those, uh, you know, uh, ex sorry, all those complexities surrounding the process of journalism. Yeah, yeah. Because, uh, I because, think, yeah. Yeah, no, I, it's a very uh, relevant uh, question. You know, um, I, I was, uh, I mean, here, what I was trying to uh, demonstrate, because I focus specifically on what the social movements are trying to do. On the part of the social movements, there is a very deliberate attempt to reframe, you know, to introduce a frame. Um, so absolutely, that's absolutely conscious. It's an activist intervention. Now, you're absolutely right that on the part of the journalists, framing is not always a conscious process. You know, we, uh, and that is acknowledged in the framing uh, literature, that uh, frames, uh, 
can sometimes be very, very conscious and deliberate, but at other times, these are because if you look at the kind of sociological literature around frames, frames are just basic ways of making sense of things. You know, so we all uh, you know, comprehend reality in certain ways. So you're absolutely, absolutely right. So the kind of more, you know, uh, so when I, if you adopt the kind of framing approach to studying uh, journalism, you can you can use it to identify what are the kinds of frames that are being used. But then absolutely, as you said, uh, for, for the research to be meaningful, uh, you know, it would be very limited to think that these are simply somehow consciously being, um, you know, uh, inserted on the basis of some agenda. Uh, no, these are part of, uh, you know, larger ideological absolutely, structures. Absolutely, we, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so, you, so you're absolutely right. We need, uh, therefore, research that would be, uh, you know, more more uh, multidimensional, that would look at political economy, sure. that would look at um, sort of discourse, that would, uh, you know, place... We need ethnography. Ethnographies uh, you know, of newsroom <laughs> ethnographies. Absolutely, yes, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I would encourage you know newsroom ethnography. We have very little of this kind of exactly. because it's hard. It's hard to do this work. So you know exactly. people don't exactly. don't do it. But absolutely. you're absolutely right. I would I hope you know maybe some students uh, are also interested in going into journalism research. I think I would or or of course in your own research practice. I think we would really, it would be valuable to have uh, ethnographic uh, accounts of, you know, journalism. Practices. Absolutely. And largely, you know, uh, triangulating various methods, you know, all together. And getting, uh, one Absolutely. more thing I wanted to, you know, uh, ask you about is you, you talked about, you know, uh, journalists, you know, building a relationship with social movements, for instance. So there I, it, it appears to me as a problem of, you know, it's a, it's a problem of the field, you know, sharing of a field mm. with somebody else. All right. So when journalism is a, in, in a, you know, a separate field of power, you know, away from the literary, political and economic fields. All right. Mm. So mm. because obviously journalism as an independent, as a distinct field will never, ever lean on to any other fields. Right. And of course, mm. uh, um, as we have been, you know, we have read that. Uh, how, how did this distinction actually take place in the early 21st century in North America? So to what extent does a person lean on to some you know, a uh, social movement, because as I see it from mm -hmm. uh, uh, from uh, certain cases like Chhattisgarh, Northeast and Kashmir, mm -hmm. if you tend to sort mm -hmm. of lean towards so certain social movement, if you sort of try to show some kind of an commitment towards some social movement, you know, so, so what is at what point of time would other people in the f other fields, you know, stop you from doing what you're particularly yeah, doing? Yeah, I, no. Yes, I, I, I think you're absolutely it's a very it's a very good question. It's a very good question, um, you know, because often these kind of relationships can also be used to delegitimize your status as a journalist. Um, you know, we're seeing in the country, actually, the government is actively, um, you know, targeting people, uh, you know, who are being linked to uh, movements on the left. Um, so, I mean, uh, this is, well, is this right? I mean, I think it's very unfortunate that we are at the moment living in supposedly democratic uh, systems where, um, you know, uh, journalists um, who are uh, wanting to engage with these issues are wanting to having uh, wanting to have these kind of long term relationships are being seen as um, suspects are being, um, you know, actively um, well uh, intimidated. Um, from from developing these kinds of relationships. I think that's really, really unfortunate. So it should not be happening in a democratic society. It should not be happening. Unfortunately, we are in that in in that situation. In this context, um, uh, what should the response of journalists be? I think, I mean, you know, it's hard for me as, as somebody who is, kind of, you know, does not have a stake in this in, in a kind of real way. I'm not a journalist to kind yeah. of say, okay, you know, do it anyway. Um, but I think it's really important uh, that you find ways of, of, of doing it. In the end, if you're doing your job um, as a journalist and you are maintaining the professional values of your, of your discipline, you should, they should be, um, you know, you should be able to stand your ground and your organization should be able to stand their ground. Um, of course, it means that we need other institutions to be working like the judiciary and all of that. Um, so, so, you know, hopefully, I mean, the idea is that we, that still will exist, persists, those freedoms persist in some way if we, 
you know, if we get pessimistic, then I think there is no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a little unconvinced by this kind of a utopic, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's not, uh, I think if you, if we see that there, it's not utopic because there are journalists who are doing these kinds of stories. Um, you know, so if, if I, I showed you some examples of, um, that are, that, that are already there. Um, I, okay, there are there are platforms in India, but of course there are also internationally. You know, you so I can t tell you the names of journalists. Um, yeah, so yeah, Rama Lakshmi from the Washington Post is somebody um, uh, who has been working consistently on the Bhopal issue. Um, uh, you know, so she has been reporting constantly. Um, yes, there are various. You know, if you're a journalist for an international organization, if you're based elsewhere, you have greater freedoms, maybe less fear. True. Um, but there are, you know, journalists, and I showed you a news click story where they are coming. So it's not as if if you tell the story, people will immediately, you know, uh, yeah. you can tell these stories. There's a, yeah, there yeah. is a scope for. So I think we also self censor, and we are saying, okay, this is not relevant. This is not going to sell, and all. Right. So I think right. there are. Right. It's it, it's not so kind of you know black and white. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, may I uh, translate a question to you because uh, there is in chat window somebody has asked, I have yes, a question, how yes. do you think those who do not have access to new media will reach to the masses since their voices do not reach the mainstream media? Yes. Um, sorry, so this is about, uh, they don't have access to new media. Yeah. Uh -huh. they are, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah, so this is absolutely a, a key problem. You know, I don't have a simple answer to this. And that's why on that last slide, when I was talking about challenges, this is, um, you know, uh, a key issue for us to be reflecting on. Um, if we are saying that we are within a kind of hybrid media system and new media allows you a pathway to getting attention of the mainstream media, what if you do not have, you need uh, skills and capacities and resources to engage with uh, new media technologies. Um, and we are seeing this problem, you know, so in the case of Bhopal, they're very lucky to have the support of some middle class activists who have been embedded within the movement from its very inception. So they've had these capacities, they've built those skills over time. But you need really that kind of, um, you know, skill, long term development, also money, of course, um, you know, to be to be exercising um, that kind of um, power. Similar, you know, um, gaps have been pointed out in movements in, 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 in the US as well. So some of the kind of um, movements uh, with migrants, um, you know, so there are, what happens then is that some people in the movement who have these capacities become the kind of dominant voice and the one might say, okay, the people who are actually the, uh, the real participants then feel excluded from some of this um, process. So absolutely, there are, we, we really need, uh, and social movements are actually acutely aware of this. So a movement like Bhopal is trying to build the capacities of its, uh, of its constituents. Um, so, you know, so they're actively doing media training for their, um, you know, for the survivors there. Um, so they've trained uh, younger people in media skills, um, you know, how to talk to the media, how to frame press releases, uh, taking pictures. Uh, they became key intermediaries so they are also doing this kind of training within the movement and i think that's the answer really that movements have to start thinking about this um and if we are supporters of movements uh, you know like some of you are maybe that's the work that you can do you know you are a you're a journalist student you probably are highly trained in this can you do some skill sharing can you do some training for for movements uh, you know who, do, who are lacking these i think this is absolutely vital that we do this work we have uh, time for one more question. This is Preksha again. Preksha, Preksha, we 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 have uh, we have uh, a question prior to you asking. Uh, for okay, okay. I'll wait. Some some Preeti Yadu is asking, uh, sir. Whenever we see any piece of news anywhere within uh, anywhere within no sp span of time, all political parties start blaming each other, even though we were to join the same blame game. This creates an atmosphere to stifle the reality of news. So is there any way to serve such news in a way that it no, not only stifles the information, but also makes the people understand the gravity of the information that's behind the blame, that's behind the yeah. blame games? I, very good question. That's a really fine question. You know, um, this is, again, you know, I don't have an easy answer uh, because so I, I did not. Um, uh, um, 
the, I showed you the Olympics example, you know, so again, what is happening very quickly with a story like that is, okay, the corporation enters the narrative. We are suddenly, mainstream media is talking about Dow's responsibility, you know, the company is responsible, something should be done, justice needs to be done. Very quickly, uh, it, it becomes a case of, uh, you know, the opposition suddenly saying, okay, why are the people not, who are in power not doing anything about it? If we were in power, we would do something. But Bhopal has been 35 years. Every party, two parties, you know, cycling in and out of power, have been in power, have been out of power, have not done anything. Um, so it's, it's, it's really, if it were not so serious, it would be funny. Uh, Dow has employed as its lawyer. So these are people who've been employed um, as their lawyers. Um, uh, Abhishek Manu Singhvi was, a, um, a, a, you know, a, uh, the a Congress person, and um, then, oh, I'm forgetting his name. Um, a key BJP uh, minister uh, who was also a lawyer was employed by Dow, and they both produced actually uh, long, um, uh, you know, analysis of why Dow is not responsible. So they, this is what the corporation is doing. You know, so it happens behind the scenes. Of course, they don't talk about it. That they have two really, really important politicians who also happen to be lawyers on their payroll. Um, so we, we see that this is, uh, you know, unfortunately, we have a media system that is in, uh, immediately, uh, you know, because it's focusing on political actors, speaks to them, and they immediately start framing it as a party political issue. On the other hand, we have these kind of secret alliances between corporations and politicians, hidden, they're not secret, but they're hidden, um, which also ensures that you know, they don't talk about the real issues when they are, um, you know, asked about these um, things. I, so there's no simple answer about how to disrupt this. I think uh, it's a question of, you know, how do you recapture the, the story? It's a struggle. I think uh, th from research, I feel that it's a, it's a bit difficult for, 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 for social movements, um, you know, to do that. But again, if you are the journalist, you know, you are the stakeholders, you can try to you know, make sure that you can disrupt this. I think, yeah, so we need some shift in also, you know, what journalists are doing. <laughs> journalists, as a journalist, if you're playing the same game, yeah, so maybe it's also about journalism training. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Reksha, you can ask. Yes, sir. Uh, so I just uh, wanted to ask you on the lines of uh, you mentioning that uh, we as students should uh, volunteer for these social movements and try to help them maybe share our own skills. So, so we uh, many of us are involved with such social movements at the moment and now that we're going to go to the um, practicing sphere of the profession, uh, we'll take these forward with us. So. Uh, to what extent can we help them as uh, professionals that it does not account as a conflict of interest on our part? Yeah. You know, that yeah. We don't favor them, but at the same time, we're there for them. Yeah, I think it's a, it's, it's a very good question. I think um, different journalists have negotiated this in different ways. So I was giving you the example of Rama Lakshmi. She, was, uh, she works for the Washington Post. So I would also encourage you to uh, look at her stories. She uh, is somebody who has been working with the Bhopal movement for a long time. I think the way she handles this conflict of interest issue is that when, if she's writing a story and she tells a story that includes the perspective of the movement or highlights the issues that the movement wants to highlight, I think that's perfectly fine because that's just your perspective as a journalist that you are highlighting certain issues. There's no conflict of interest there. However, when she, uh, did some kind of direct helping, like so she uh, helped the movement in building a museum um, for the movement uh, locally. Um, when she was doing that project, she actually stepped away from her role uh, at the post for I think a period of maybe a year um, or six months. She actually stopped writing stories during that period and she just focused on that. So I think yeah, so that's how she kind of balanced it, that in that period she did not, uh, she kind of in a, stepped away from a journalist role so that she could actually say that she was not um, in a sense of mixing her, her professional responsibilities. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a, ethics in journalism is a, you know, these have to be negotiated in practice. These are not black and white. I think, you know, my point about um, journalistic values, if in your work as a journalist, you're adhering to journalistic values, um, 
you know you're 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 fine uh um, you know if you if you're not doing that then you know then there's a problem if you write a story that's poorly researched um uh, simply reproducing something that you know you you're hearing from the movement then of course that's that's uh, suspect from a professional standpoint um so i think yeah it's um, hopefully that gives you some sense of how you know this question may be answered but i would I would I would say that you know don't see this as being sort of fundamentally opposed that these are kind of fields that are you know separated. Uh, we we need people who are straddling fields really uh, to make sure that we get different kinds of stories. Thanks a lot, sir. This has been on my mind since very long, and I think I got an answer. Thank you. Okay. UK, we can't hear you. UK, ma'am, you are inaudible. Yeah, I'm trying to. Yes, yes. Now you're. Now you. We can hear you now. We can hear Perfect. you. Perfect. I was just saying that the, the, these questions will continue, uh, because all of them have so many questions to ask you. Maybe I can request them to email it to me, sure. and I can forward it to you. I sure. understand you have time constraints. <laughs> yes. We can um, maybe call it a day for a moment. And this is just momentary. And whenever you get a chance to come to India, I would like to personally invite you for a lecture at our yes. university. Great. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. I would be thank you, uh, you know, to everyone who is on the call, to the students who asked the questions, of course, to Yuki um, and to Imran um, for you. giving me this opportunity. I, I must say, I really enjoyed uh, speaking to you, and I'm also really uh, encouraged by the fact that so many of the students are, are thinking about these issues, are wanting to occupy this space, uh, you know, between journalism and activism. And I would really encourage you to do it. I think it's so important. Uh, that that you do so so i'm 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 really really um happy on that count uh yeah <laughs> thank, thank you thank you very much thank you very much thank, thank you to you. all the participants thank, thank you, you. <laughs> bye